on, people. So I'm watching this trial, and they call this sidebar in the morning. So I kind of, in case someone else is watching it, uh, this is live, but it's odd on what they come back after the sidebar. So if you're ever on a jury trial, and they have these little sidebars, and the judge, and they have these secret meetings, and they have the jury leave and come back. Those are all clues, and you can kind of predict what's going on by what happens afterwards. So this one, I'm thinking they're arguing that one of the jurors violated one of the rules and watched the news or discussed the case or did an experiment. But let's watch it. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Your Honor. Elizabeth Little. Also, I'm happy to Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Your Honor. David Yannetti for Karen Reed. Good morning, Ms. Yannetti. Good morning, Ms. Reed. All right, did counsel want to see me at sidebar? I had asked, Your Honor. Okay. Okay, so they have this sidebar. Let's see if I can bump this up. It was a pretty long sidebar. Hell. It was longer than I thought. Oh. So they, they went to a break. So they have this long sidebar. All the attorneys and the judge leave. So the jury's kind of like, I wonder what's going on. And now they bring the jury back, and this is what happens. Good morning again, Ms. Reed. Good morning, jurors. Happy Friday. And I appreciate you all being here, ready, willing, and able to start. We got an awfully lot done in about five or seven minutes over here at sidebar. So we made you wait, but in the long run, it's not. This is the judge's way of trying to make the jury seem dumb and like, oh no, nothing's going on and we really saved you guys a lot of time and we don't want you to think we're being sneaky and we don't want you to know what's going on. That's bullshit. That's exactly what they're doing. We made you wait, but in the long run, it's not. Um, speed things up and make things go more smoother. So we appreciate And I have this turned up to one and a half speed, so it seems fast. So same three questions. Have you all been able to follow the instruction? And refrain from discussing this case with anyone since we left us today. Yes. Yes. Said yes or not affirmatively. Um, she also puts on the record that everybody acknowledged yes or nodded affirmatively, meaning nobody went, no, I violated it. So she's getting this on the record and locking down all jurors because I'm thinking all this discussion was one of the jurors saw something, read something, or because of the questions that she asked. Follow the instruction and refrain from doing any independent research or investigation into this case. Yes. Everyone said yes or nodded affirmatively. Did anyone happen to see, hear, or read anything about this case since we left yesterday? No. Uh, one thing I did want to say to you folks is if you can't hear a witness or a lawyer or you can't see something. So she got the questions that she wanted. She locked all the juries down. So when they call a jury, if there was jury misconduct and they call this jury back later, they're going to be able to have a stronger case for lying or perjury and more reason to kick this juror off but she went into oh let me help you if you have a problem hearing this was what i call a distraction or a redirection so the juror isn't thinking why did she ask us these questions oh maybe one of them said we couldn't hear and that's why this this to me that was the the judge's way to manipulate the jury so if you raise your hand, the court officers don't have the power to say to the witness, uh, please answer that again and speak louder. Court officers don't have the power to say to the witness, uh, please answer that again and speak louder. But I do. So if you raise your hand, court officer will come over and let me know, and we can make sure that happens. So. Okay, so I'm watching the trial a little bit further, and then this happens. And as soon as this started, I connected the earlier thing, and I'm like, oh. So it sounds like there's a accusation of jury tampering or somebody said or did something and they have a witness who is represented by an attorney so i haven't watched this so i don't know what's going to happen but this ought to be interesting okay so um why don't counsel identify yourselves please sure i'm Lally for the commonwealth your honor hey. Sorry, McLaughlin for the commonwealth. Hey, good morning Good morning, Your Honor. Timothy Bradel on behalf of uh, non-party Aiden Carney, who for the record is present in the courtroom. Hey, does Mr. Carney want to sit with you? I think he's okay right there. Okay. That's all right. So this is the attorney that's representing the guy who made the allegation. I think. I could be wrong, but I think this is what's going on. Right, Your Honor. All right. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the jury is not here for this. 
So when, when the jury is kicked out, they have all these problems, and then they get to decide whether or not the jury can hear any of it, part of it, or will the attorneys just agree to, will admonish the jury as a whole and they don't need to know about this. I have no idea what's going to happen. So, Commonwealth, um, so I do want to say a question before we begin. Commonwealth, in your motion um, to exclude an individual charged with witness intimidation in connection with this case from the courtroom during the testimony of certain witnesses, before we begin, uh, are you... So they're accusing witness intimidation before the testimony. Um, let me think of a situation that this could be. Witness intimidation by the defense could be, I know a prosecution witness and I'm going to make a comment when she walks by to the DA investigator or the DA investigator may say as this witness walked by and goes, yeah, I sure hope that witness don't try to lie about her phone calls. And the witness told the prosecution and now the prosecution says that's bullshit. They're trying to intimidate you. So it can be very minor, it can be intentional. It's usually just trying, both sides are trying to get, hey, the other side's dirty, it's not me. And the other side is like, no, the other side's dirty, not me. Whatever, it's all a game. Advancing the concerns of the DA's office or the concerns of the witnesses themselves or both? Both, Your Honor. Okay, so... Just if I may, I'm sorry to jump in, but just if I may, I oh. do have a, what I think is a pretty substantial procedural objection. Okay. Maybe I'd ask that you sort of just make a quick <coughs> bifurcation of the issues here and we can address the procedural issue before we get into the, the substance of the motion. Sure, I'll hear you. We could. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, just for, so the record is clear, um, because we may need an appellate record in this case, okay. um, but... Uh, I was here in, in the Norfolk Superior Court today, uh, completely unrelated to Mr. Carney, my client, as you know, in, in the other matters. And I was here today on the matter of uh, Commonwealth versus Tylee Curry for a motion to suppress. And, and which, which is a case that I am in the middle of right. that motion to suppress with you. Exactly. And I actually figured that we wouldn't do the motion and get a date. Um, but I was fully focused on that matter and had no notice whatsoever that uh, the Commonwealth was, was in the Reed matter, was seeking to exclude my client as a journalist from this courtroom. Um, the first, so the first thing is that, and, and I know the court has a job to do in terms of ruling on this motion, and that's fine. Um, and I ask that the ruling be that it be denied on procedural grounds. The, the procedural grounds are, Judge, that there's been no, ser no service of process whatsoever on a case where the government is seeking to uh, essentially uh, trample all over my client's First Amendment rights as a journalist. Um, on 15 minutes notice. You know, I know you gave me the, the thing 15 or 20 minutes ago. And it's more than a half an hour, but I understand. <laughs> all right, well, you get the point. So, um, you know, this is not something that I can uh, process and absorb and make any sort of cogent arguments on the merits of the motion uh, on that time period. I, I'm sure that the court respects that. Um, I'm trying to uh, address it as best I can, but I think that the procedural issues here uh, should control. And here's the procedural situation, Your Honor, um, that the government filed this six-page motion. Uh, there's a footnote, too, that refers to them serving this motion on May 8th to the Associated Press. Why they couldn't just pull up my email and serve me is an open question that I'd like an answer to in open court. Um, so they can serve the AP two days ago, but they can, they can wait and not even serve me with the motion when I get here to court today on a completely unrelated matter, I might add. So there's some, there's some funny business going on here. And you know, there's been nothing but funny business from where I sit uh, from the Commonwealth on Mr. Carney's matters. And here we go again. So I don't appreciate that from counsel. So this is a defense attorney that sounds like he's pissed off at the DA and they're kind of trying to blow him off and instead of serving him as a representative of his client they serve the AP I don't know for publicity or what but you can tell this attorney's not happy about it from the Norfolk County DA's office number one number two your honor I don't know how this gets to witness unless this journalist is a witness here now he said he has a suppression motion on a different case a suppression hearing is, I've talked about it before, is if the government seizes evidence and they seize it when they're not allowed to be where they're at, or they seize it illegally, or it's done improperly, or they have somebody else do it for them and they shouldn't have, all that evidence can be suppressed, but the attorney has to file an appeal to have a suppression hearing and then they get all the evidence and the judge says, I'm going to allow the evidence or I'm going to suppress it. You can't use it. Kind of like the knife, the bloody knife of O.J. Simpson. His attorney, O.J. gave his attorney his knife. A client can't give evidence against, or a lawyer can't give evidence against his client. So the the attorney, O.J.'s attorney, gave it to the court and said, I don't want to hide evidence. I don't want to commit a crime. 
but I have the knife. But if I give you the knife, you can't use it against my client because I can't give evidence against him. So they gave it to the court and the court suppressed the knife. So the, the prosecution could never bring up that OJ gave his attorney the bloody knife that was used to kill them. That never came up on the trial and the jury never heard it. That was a suppression hearing and the judge pretty much said, you can't use the knife. Mr. Carney has covered this case and written about 350 news articles on this case. He has developed evidentiary scoops on this case that have added to the quantum of evidence in the matter. He's never- So it sounds like his client has been reporting on this case and pissing off the DA because he's not posting favorable shit for the DA. So the DA is trying to go after him or shut him up. That's what it sounds like. Never caused a problem. He wishes to be in the galley of journalists like everyone else and cover the case. There's never been a problem whatsoever. This is more personalized retaliation from the Norfolk County DA's office against Mr. Carney. Another point, Your Honor, is that this matter, as far as the Commonwealth is concerned, is race judicata times two. Judge Krupp in this very court addressed this exact issue about Mr. Carney covering this matter, being in the courtroom with witnesses that had a stay away order. All the same people that the government is trying to have another bite at the apple with here. All these people, this was adjudicated fully with the special assistant DA before Judge Krupp, and Judge Krupp ruled against the Commonwealth. Judge Krupp said that Mr. Carney was able to be in the courthouse covering this case, regardless of any of these witnesses in the stay away order. The stay away order was exempted from uh, Mr. Car uh, Mr. Carney's presence in the courtroom, rather, was accepted from the stay away order. Okay. So this is done, this has been adjudicated. It's been adjudicated again, Your Honor, by uh, Judge Pomerol across the street in the district court. Um, one of these, one of these uh, people associated with Mr. Carney's detractors, Ms. Gatani, has taken up with the Commonwealth and s sought charges and sought a restraining order against my client. And Judge Pomerol recently, as, a ma as recently, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we were across the street, Your Honor, um, seeking to vacate the order under the doctrine of unclean hands because this plaintiff keeps trying to contact my client while under a restraining order. Okay, so the doctrine of unclean hands is, how do I explain this? If you enter into an agreement contract or action when you're doing something wrong, you enter into that interaction with unclean hands. So the courts can kind of ignore, even though you're right, because you entered it dirty, it's the unclean hands. Unclean hands, I, I would be close to fruits of the poisonous tree. If I get evidence that I'm a bad way, and that evidence leads me to more evidence, if that evidence is suppressed, all the evidence I find because of that evidence is also suppressed because the evidence I found was based on the evidence I got wrong. So that's fruits of the poisonous tree. Unclean hands is close to that. Putting that aside, the ruling in that matter, Judge, was another, another ruling in support of Mr. Carney's First Amendment rights. It was another ruling that said Mr. Carney was not subject to the restraining order in any court of the Commonwealth. And the reason we brought that motion, Your Honor, was because these same witnesses that the government here is, again, trying to advocate for their own personal issues, those same witnesses somehow took up with this plaintiff across the street, Ms. Gatani, brought her to court here in prior read proceedings to kick out Mr. Carney, because at the time she had an operative order against him. And Mr. Carney, to his credit, got up and left and got out of here. Ooh. So maybe I got this wrong, but it sounds like Someone has a protective order on this guy. The government couldn't keep him out. The DA couldn't kick him out and didn't want him covering it. So they got the person with the restraining order to come to court. So this guy had to leave. So this is, this is a, a paramount. Oh, the rooster just showed up. This is kind of the same thing as if I want to search your house and I can't get reason to search your house. So I find Tyrone who has a felony warrant and I go, dude, I want you to go in this house. And then once you get in the house, we're gonna come in and arrest you. And that way we'll be in the house and we can look for things while we're in there because we can't get in the other way. That's, that's illegal, it's wrong. It's done, but it's wrong. It used to be, it used to be cops a long time ago would go to a payphone back when they had payphones and they would call an anonymous tip hey, so-and-so with a warrant just entered this house. And the cops would swarm on the house, enter the house. The, the guy wasn't there. There was nobody there with a warrant, but the cops were in there on a legitimate anonymous call 
Therefore, they were allowed to be where they were going to be, and if they saw any contraband in plain sight, they could seize it, and that would give them information to get a warrant, search the whole house. So that's how that's called. That's why the courts have ruled since that anonymous calls is not enough reason to go and violate the Fourth Amendment. Unfair right to search and seizure. And that situation was what we addressed across the street with Judge Pomerol. He agreed with us and said, <laughs> "That's funny. Government's crookedness never. So government is people. People will do, especially when you get egos and wanting to win, and then you add in power and money and publicity, and you get all this. You're going to get corruption. I am still. I know I'm pissed people off here. I am still not convinced that there is a big conspiracy to frame this girl." Is there a conspiracy and lying? Is the government up to no good? Probably. But did everybody get together and go, we're up to no good and let's get this innocent woman and let's send her to prison for life just because? I, I'm just not there. Am I convinced that she did it? I haven't seen the whole case, so I don't know all the evidence against her. But I'm not convinced that she didn't do it. I'm not convinced she did it. But I'm also not convinced that there's this big conspiracy to blame this poor innocent woman that's being portrayed. I'm, I'm just, that's where I'm at right now, people. Sorry, you can hate me. I've already gotten a lot of hate. You can go to court, you can cover this case. So number two, litigation number two, this has been, this has been established. Um, Mr. Carney followed all proper channels. Uh, we worked with the uh, SJC media office. Uh, he has a press pass. He's doing everything in accordance with all of the rules and regulations that uh, are in place. He's been harassed and we have it on video by uh, other so-called journalists uh, in, in, in also, now that I'm hearing this, I thought this was connected with the earlier warning or questions to the jury. Now, as I'm hearing this, I don't think this concerns the jury, and I'm still confused on why she asked them, did you comply? I need an affirmative yes. Are you following the rules, etc.? Normally, that doesn't happen unless one of the attorneys says, I suspect something, and I want you to ask the juror if they're complying. And the judge will go, okay, I'll ask them. So I, I don't know if these are connected now. On this case, in, in, at, at the steps of the courthouse, and he just wants to be here. He, he doesn't want to be an issue in this case. He wants to sit here and cover the case. He's done his job. He wants to watch the trial unfold. And he has an absolute fundamental First Amendment right to do so within the, within the confines of... Uh, of It'll be answering if the government gets up here and goes, Your Honor, a judge issued a restraining order and that client has a right to be here. And because he has a restraining order, he can't be here. It's just as much her right to be here as it is him. I, I'm waiting for this. This courtroom and within the confines of time, place and manner restrictions, he's followed everything and he's here. We've gone through all of these hurdles, Your Honor. And Mr. Carney triumphed as he should, because it's the First Amendment that needs to triumph here, not any particular person. And that's what he's doing. And there's absolutely no reason for the government to sneak behind my back to interfere with his First Amendment rights. It's outrageous. And on procedural grounds, I ask you to deny the motion for all of those reasons. And if the court has some hesitancy to do so with respect to these procedural issues, I ask that you set a date in, give me seven days or so, so that I can properly respond to this motion on the merits of whatever's in these six pages of motion of the motion that I haven't been able to look at. So thank you for hearing me, Your Honor. All right, sure. And you wanted to... What the judge, what the attorney just did here, which is kind of slick, <laughs> he said, if you want to rule against me or you don't think I'm in my case, I would like seven days to prepare a more detailed case. Well, they're not going to stop the trial for seven days. But the judge may say, all right, I'm not going to rule on it. I'll give you your seven days. And for those seven days, he can stay here. And I don't know if this trial is going to last another seven days, but we'll see. I think that's what he was doing. Oh, I must have jumped pretty far. I don't know what happened here. Hang on. Okay, I'm back to the right spot. Sorry. Sure. And you wanted a response to your question from Mr. Lally on why you were not served, but the Associated Press. I'm assuming this is the guy. Could you talk about that in the procedural part of this, Mr. Lally? Yes, Your Honor. Um, simply put, uh, Mr. Bradle, neither Mr. Bradle nor Mr. Kearney are parties to the case. Um, I can't presume that Mr. Bradle's representation on one criminal case is going to extend to a motion of which he would be at best a third party um, on a separate criminal case. We are required under the SJC rules to serve it uh, upon the Associated Press, which we did. 
So I, I think that's your record now, Mr. Bradle. Thank you. Okay, on the procedural issue, okay. Um, we have a jury out. I do want to address the merits of this um, as best we can. And Mr. Bradle, uh, at the end of this hearing, whatever I end up doing, um, if you want to come back and readdress it when there's more time, um, depending on how I rule, I'll give you the opportunity to do so. But I have to get this trial moving at sure. this point one way or the other. So I'm going to hear the Commonwealth on their motion. Then I'll hear you, Mr. Bradle, to the extent that you can respond, okay? All right, Mr. Lally, I'll hear you on your motion. Your Honor, very shortly and very simply put, this is uh, an instance in which the Commonwealth is not asking uh, that Mr. Kearney not be allowed to cover the case or that he not be allowed to watch the trial. Um, it, what we're requesting is a partial closure uh, of one individual. Um, and the legal standard for that is uh, essentially a substantial reason. The substantial reason, Your Honor, being that Mr. Kearney has been indicted and has open cases for intimidating witnesses, specifically witnesses in this case. Um, he has confirmed. Ooh, so the guy watching has been indicted and charged with intimidating witnesses in this case. That, that might hold some merit on, if depending on what witness he's intimidating, if those witnesses talked or the witness has to testify in front of a person that has been charged for intimidating them, this might have some merit. Uh, statements uh, indicating publicly uh, that his actions that he's taken in regard to those indictments were to prevent the case from ever going to trial uh, and to uh, intimidate those witnesses. Those witnesses will be called to testify uh, in this case, and what the Commonwealth is simply requesting is that he be excluded physically from the courtroom, not excluded from watching the trial, not excluded from covering the trial, but excluded physically from the courtroom while those witnesses are uh, testifying from the stand. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. If he's charged, even though it's probably bullshit charges and they're just trying to do whatever, if he's charged and they had enough to charge him for intimidating a witness and that witness has to testify with him sitting back there with a computer, I would agree. I don't think he ought to be in a courtroom. That's just me. I know somebody's going to be here. You're a Jack Blue News Freedom of the Press, Rick. How dare you? I'm just tell It sounds reasonable to me. And the, the witnesses you told me have expressed concern. What do you say about that? Yes, Your Honor. The witnesses have expressed concern. Uh, the Commonwealth is concerned as to uh, his presence affecting their testimony or their ability to recall. Uh, and for all of those reasons, the Commonwealth would submit the administration of, of justice and the witnesses being able to testify, as well as uh, the witnesses' own concerns uh, are more than meet the test of the substantial reason uh, for Mr. Kearney's exclusion during the course of their testimony. Okay. Mr. Bradle? Your Honor, the witness's concern has no legal materiality under the law. May not have under the law, but I don't want... Uh, I talked about one case where the, the, the defendant, this dude, had, uh, he was a gang member and this one little girl, I say little girl, she looked like she was an adult. She was only like 13 or 14. She held a little teddy bear on a stand while she was testifying. And she asked me to stand next to her, I think, at some time during the trial because she was kind of nervous. And while she was testifying, the dude who was all tatted up and the gang member that was like pretty much told her she was dead if she testified, we had this girl in protective custody. We had her hidden in a hotel. And while she was testifying, he was sitting there, and he had to be in the courtroom because he's, he's being charged. He's a defendant. So he had to be in the courtroom. But when she's testifying, she was scared to death. When she's testifying, he's looking at her, and he's like mad dogging her and giving these expressions and just totally, in my book, intimidating her. So I tell the DA, I go, dude, uh, it was a female, uh, Lindsay. I can't think of her last name. I think it was Lindsay. So she's a DA prosecutor, and I go over to her, and I whisper to her, hey, the defendant's mad-dogging and eye-fucking the witness and trying to intimidate her. The court needs to tell him to knock that shit off. So the attorney puts it on the record and goes, Your Honor, I was just informed that the defendant is shaking his head, making behavioral, threatening, intimidating ways, and trying to intimidate the witness. Can you instruct him not to do that? And... The judge goes, you're not allowed to look or try to intimidate, etc." And of course, he was like, and this was all done in front of the jury, which made the case stronger because not only do we have this girl in protective custody 
and we think that they're going to try and kill her because of her testimony, now this guy's trying to intimidate her on her stand. So to me, if I want the truth, and this person doesn't have to be in the courtroom, why not remove him? That To me, that's a no-brainer. I think the judge ought to rule probably in the Commonwealth's favor on this. I don't, I know I don't like to go in the government's favor, but in this case, I kind of am. Answer that I have is, so what? <laughs> so it sounds like what, what he's saying is, since there's no legal reasoning to exclude somebody because of a witness feelings, don't, he shouldn't be excluded. And in part, I kind of agree with him a little bit. If every witness is able to say, I don't want the media in the courtroom. I don't like this attorney. He intimidated me. I can't testify. I don't. And then you have the witnesses controlling a public hearing. So, again, there's a balance here. The witness is concerned. Where does that fit into the law here, Your Honor? Uh, this matter has been adjudicated twice. Mr. Carney has the right to speak on the case. He's gone through all the proper channels to be here. He is not in any way wants to or is trying to make any issue of his presence here. And he's just trying to cover the case as, as, as best he can. And this is just a personal vendetta that's been carried out by the Norfolk County DA's office. I totally agree with this. If it's been adjudicated twice, that means they've taken him to trial twice. It sounds like they're not winning or getting convictions and they're pissed off at him. So this is a way to stick it to him and punish him. I mean, if I was the attorney, I'd be, I'd probably say something stupid like, my client wants to be in here. If his face intimidates the witness, the court, I'm, I, he's agreed that he will wear a paper bag with just eye holes while he's uh, sitting back there so he can't intimidate the witness. And of course, everybody would laugh and the judge would be pissed off and say, that's not funny, but I'd probably do it anyway. It's against Mr. Carney. And you know this is where this is the this is where the court needs to hold the line on the First Amendment. You know this this witness intimidation. Usually, judges when he says the court, he's talking about the judge. Usually, courts don't like being told what they should do or need to do. You state the law, you state your opinion, and then they get to make the decision. When you start telling a judge what you need to do, then they want to push back a little bit, like, hey. I'm a freaking judge. Nobody tells me what I need to do. I'll rule against you just because you told me I need to do it. And I'm going to show you that I don't need to listen to you because it's ego. Intimidation statute, Your Honor, is an absolute abomination. It is going to be struck down. It's just a matter of time. And this is just a continuation of everything the special counsel's been doing to Mr. Carney. And now uh, the office itself is doing it. Um, there's So... From a judge's perspective on this, this isn't appealable to affect the case. Judges are concerned about, do I want to make a procedural error that can be appealed and my rulings can be overturned, or do I, I just do the right thing? So if it affects the case, I get it. Whether she rules he stays or gets out, can't hurt her. A matter of fact, if she allows him in, it may be able to hurt her if a witness says later, I was going to say this, but I was scared to say it because I had to see him. That could get her in trouble for allowing him to stay. My guess is she's going to boot him, but I don't know. I could be wrong. We'll see. There's no reason for this motion to be allowed, Your Honor. There's, there's, no, there's no discomfort exception to the First Amendment, Your Honor. Um, there's had been absolutely nothing. Actually, there is plenty of discomfort to the First Amendment. I can't say that I have a bomb. I can't say I want to blow something up. There's a public safety set. I can't call somebody the N-word because it's racist and it's inflammatory. I can't. There's a lot of things that the First Amendment, they water down. So I would like it to be absolute. I think it should be. I think you ought to be able to say, I want to blow up the White House. I want to blow up the president. I want to I'd like to kill that. I'd like to blow that person's head off. So what? If you should not be charged for speaking your mind or sharing your opinion, that should not be suppressed because the smallest suppression of free ideas and free thinking and free speech leads to total censorship by the government. And that's where we're heading now. But I digress. Thing advanced 
especially on an emergency basis, which is, I, I assume, why this is being done with no notice. Um, there's been no uh, establishment of any emergency. Uh, there's been no conduct whatsoever. I would argue the emergency is this is a trial that's ongoing. A witness is about to come, and if it can affect her testimony, and we can remove the possibility, even if there's a chance that she could be intimidated or that she may it may affect her recollection to recall because she's nervous or she's being scared or distracted by this guy, if we can prevent that by removing him just for the witness and just for that area, then he can come back in and he can watch it on TV. What's the harm? I think the government's going to win with the judge on this one. On the part of Mr. Carney to justify this motion. And I did happen to see some reference to the Chesna trial about uh, published is something to the effect of uh, doxing a seated juror. That is false. Okay, doxing means that you've given out the name and address, and if they're alleging that he doxed a juror and said, hey, this is a juror, this is where she lives, that could be a crime, that could be witness intimidation, that could be whatever they want to, I'm sure there's some rule or law somewhere. So if he did that, it's false, but the government, a lot of times, like cops do all the time, oh, you're obstructing my investigation, you're going to jail. Oh, the DA dismissed the charges. Guess what? I still booked your ass in jail. You still sat in jail. You still led to post-trial. You still got booked. You got fingerprinted. You got photographs. And now you have a record. It's a win-win for a cop to do it because there's no accountability. That's kind of what the government does. Mr. Carney wrote a story on a juror after the jury was discharged. There's absolutely no prohibition or problem or issue with that. And it is absolutely protected conduct by the First Amendment. And it is not in any way a grounds for uh, this court or the Commonwealth to, to assert any wrongdoing against him. So I can assure you I am not considering that incident in this. You all know I was the judge. I am not considering that experience in this motion. She didn't say she wasn't going to kick him out. She just said... Her decision isn't going to use that bit of information. Okay. I still think if I was a judge, I'd say I think it's reasonable that he's not going to be here when those witnesses testify because there's a prior conduct. They don't let other witnesses sit in a courtroom, and there's not an intimidation issue. The wife and the husband that are testifying, the husband can't sit out there and watch the wife, and the wife can't sit out there and watch them. All witnesses are excluded. So if you can exclude other people as witnesses because they might hear the trial or be influenced, I don't see the harm in removing this guy. I know somebody's going to call me a jackboot, but I think this is reasonable. Sorry. Thank you. Honey. Anything further, Mr. Nothing Bradle? Further. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Mr. Bradle, I agree with you that uh, Mr. Kearney has certified, um, is certified by the Office of Public Information pursuant to SJC Rule 119, and that he has a right to be here today, he arrived timely, and that he is registered. Uh, I have honored that 119 registration today and I will continue to honor that however my however <laughs> uh, I think she's gonna do it in this case Commonwealth versus Karen Reed is to assure that the defendant's constitutional right to a fair trial uh, are honored and upheld and because of the chilling effect that Mr. Kearney's presence I find will have on the witnesses testimony I'm going to excuse him while the named witnesses in the Commonwealth's motion makes sense to me now he tried to say can you give me seven days to do this and she's like she's going to say I'm going to exclude him and if you want to go ahead and file the motion afterwards you can go ahead and do it uh anyway I'm at 34 minutes um all right, I'll post this and uh, we'll go this trial. I hate getting into these trials because I, I, I get hooked. And so now I'm sitting on my ass drinking and snacking watching this. And uh, I wish I wasn't. But that's all right. I'm going to play pickleball in a couple hours. So, all right, we'll end that there.